grain of sand held at arm's length. The Hubble focused on that spot for 10 days, took a bunch of pictures. When they put them all together, they said, man, there are more stars there than we can count. These are ones we didn't know about before. Amazing universe God built. The Bible says, speak to the earth and it shall teach thee. The earth is like a big magnet. Now, magnets always lose their strength. The earth's magnet has lost 10% of its strength in the last 150 years. Well, that's normal for magnets to lose their strength, but that's interesting. That proves the earth is not more than 25,000 years old. This is a limiting factor. Because if you go backwards in time, the magnetic field was stronger, and at some point it becomes too strong for life to exist here because of the heat generated, among other things. It also proves carbon dating can't work because carbon dating is directly proportional to the magnetic field because as the magnetic field declines, more radiation gets in and that's what forms carbon-14. We cover more on that in video 7. But in 1949, when they first invented carbon dating, the leg of a mammoth dated 15,000 years old, but the skin from the same mammoth dated 21,000 years old. <laughs> Didn't work. And it got worse as time went along. 1975, one part of a mammoth was 29,000 years old, another part's 44,000 from the same animal. Cover much more on video 7 about that, uh, or on our website, drdino.com, if you want more on carbon dating. Uh, the textbook says, well, yes, Hoven, the magnetic field is declining, but that's because it's part of a pattern of reversals. It's getting ready to reverse. The magnetic field is declining and it's going to flip over. Nobody has a clue how it even could reverse. There is no proof it ever has, and there are no magnetic reversals locked in the, in the, in the, in the ocean floor. What we've observed for 150 years is the magnetic field is declining. That's observable science. The rest is purely theoretical. Actually, there's an interesting article in the, in the beginning book, Walt Brown's book, about the magnetic reversal mythology here. It's a matter of stronger and weaker magnetism, not magnetic reversals. As this is all part of another theory called Pangea. How many have ever heard of Pangea theory before? They say all the continents used to fit together. I get asked this question every week. Hey, Hovind, do you think all the continents used to fit together? I say, well, they didn't tell you they shrank Africa nearly 40% to make them fit, did they? I bet they didn't tell you they took out all of Mexico and Central America. Hey, Senor, que pasa? Donde esta Mexico, Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala? And also, they don't tell you what I think ought to be obvious to a kindergartner. Did you know if you take the water out of the oceans, there is dirt underneath? Hmm? People say, do you think the continents were connected? I say, what do you mean were? They still are. <laughs> Hello? It's not hollow under the oceans, you know. <laughs> it's just the low places are full of water, that's all. Uh, duh. <clears throat> we cover more on the Pangea theory on videotape number six of our series. What a dumb theory. Um, the Earth is spinning about 1,000 miles an hour. 1,041.6 for you technical folks at the equator. But the Earth is slowing down. It actually is slowing down enough to create a problem. Every year to year and a half, they have to add a second to the clock because the Earth is slowing down. They call it a leap second. 1990, Pensacola News Journal said, we have to add a tick to the clock because Earth's rotation is slowing down. It says regular clocks use days as a measure which are going longer by a thousandth of a second or more daily as Earth's rotation slows. 1992, Astronomy Magazine said, Earth's rotation is slowing down. June will be one second longer than normal. We will have a leap second. Leap second. Did you know we have a leap second about every year to year and a half? Because the Earth is slowing down. Now kids, this is going to be complicated, so listen carefully. The Earth is spinning, but it is slowing down. So that means that it used to be going faster. <laughs> How many can figure this out now with no help? Okay. Well now, the earth is only 6,000 years old. This is no problem. It was going a little faster when Adam was here. He wouldn't notice. He didn't have a watch anyway, as far as we know. But some of these guys want me to believe the earth is billions of years old. Man, if you go back billions of years, the world was spinning real fast. <laughs> Your days and nights would be pretty quick. Get up, go to bed, get up, go to bed, get up, go to bed. <laughs> You never get nothing done. <clears throat> the centrifugal force would have been enormous. The winds would have been 5,000 miles an hour from the Coriolis effect. And you think dinosaurs lived 200 million years ago? Oh, I know what happened to them. They got blown off. No, they did not live 200 million years ago. The Sahara Desert has what's called a prevailing wind pattern. The wind almost always blows the same way. This creates a problem. 
The hot air blows off the desert and kills the trees next door, and that area becomes desert. The process is called desertification. Well, now, they've done quite a bit of study on Sahara. It's pretty obvious it is growing. There's just no question about that. But they said, after studying it for years, they said, you know, the Sahara Desert is probably about 4,000 years old. Okay. I, I have no reason to doubt that, but I do have a question. If the Sahara is only 4,000 years old, why don't we have a bigger desert someplace? Why would the biggest desert on Earth be less than 4,000 years old? Well, I have a theory about that. Now, here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. It's pretty hard to have a desert under a flood. Mm, right? So the desert couldn't start growing until the flood water went down. So I predict, based on the Bible, the biggest desert in the world will be less than 4,400 years old. <laughs> it is. <laughs> wow. Maybe the Bible's right. Did you know when they drill into the ground, sometimes they hit oil? The oil's oftentimes under incredible pressure, like 20,000 pounds per square inch. It'll come squirting up out of the ground, poof, like a big zit. 20,000 PSI. Well, the guys who study this problem say, you know, the, the oil has some pressure simply because of the rocks on top of it. It's called the overlying weight of the rock, the overburden. That produces pressure. But the oil pressure is greater than the weight of overbearing rock. So this should have cracked the rock and equalized the pressure in less than 10,000 years. Okay, well, if all that's true, then I have a question. Why do we still have oil pressure? Actually, where did the oil come from? Well, most scientists agree, and I agree with them, that oil comes from organisms that are squished. They're changed by heat and pressure into oil. Clear back in 1970, they learned, 71, they learned how to make oil in 30 minutes, 20 or 30 minutes in the laboratory. In 1996, they set up a factory in Australia to turn sewage sludge into oil in 30 minutes. They opened up a factory in Texas a couple years ago, can turn almost anything to oil. They're taking turkey guts and turning it into oil with heat and pressure. Check it out, Discover Magazine, May of 2003. Sinclair Gas Company has the dinosaur as their logo. They say dinosaurs turn to oil. Yes, boys and girls, these dinosaurs, dinosaurs mellowed for 80 million years. I don't think so. I have a theory about the oil, and here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. In that flood, lots of critters and people drowned. And they got covered up by the gravel and the rocks and the mud and the sand, and it got pretty heavy after a while, and it squished them <laughs> into oil. So the oil's down there today from the people and animals that drowned in that flood. Which means, if you stop and think about that, you drove over here today on some of your ancestors. <laughs> Next time you're pumping them in there, you can say, Bye, Grandpa. You, sh <laughs> you should have listened to Noah. <laughs> he told you it was going to rain. You should have got on that boat. Hmm? Yeah. I was preaching in Denver, Colorado one time, and some guys came to the meeting, and they said, uh, Hoven, uh, can we talk to you for a minute? I said, sure. After the meeting, we talked, and they said, now look, you know, we know that you go around teaching the earth is 6,000 years old. Uh, we'd like to prove you're wrong. Would you come with us, please? I said, sure. These guys worked at the National Ice Core Laboratory, just outside of Denver. They said, we go to, the Green to Greenland and to the South Pole, and we drill holes through the ice. Government job, you know. Uh, and we save the center part of the hole. Oh, we need more ice, that's for sure. We're running out of ice. Go spend a billion dollars, go to Greenland and get some. Uh, well, they drill these holes down in the ice. They take what's called a core sample. Here's a picture of the coring machine. This thing drills down and snaps off a six to 10 foot section of ice and pulls it up out of the hole. And they said, we want to show you these ice cores, Mr. Hoven. Come on in the freezer. They took me in this massive freezer they've got there, about as big as this auditorium, 36 below zero in there. And they took these ice cores out of their styrofoam tubes and laid one on the table and said, now see this ice core here? I said, yep. They said, you see the rings on there? It looks like tree rings, dark and light and dark and light. I said, oh yeah, they're very clear. Interesting. They said, now Hoven, in the summer, it, the snow melts just a little bit on top and then it refreezes and makes clear ice, which shows up dark here on the picture. In the winter, it packs the snow and it makes white ice. So what we have here are examples of summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, just like annual rings of a tree. I said, okay. They said, now the deepest hole we ever drilled is 10,000 feet. And we counted 135,000 annual rings. And here you are claiming the earth is 6,000 years old. Hoven, you're wrong. I said, now fellas, aren't you assuming those are annual rings? 
See, apparently they didn't know about the Lost Squadron, but some airplanes ran out of gas during World War II and landed in Greenland. How many have ever heard of the Lost Squadron? It's been on TV a couple times. Go to thelostsquadron.com and see all about it. Well, a rich man from Kentucky got a brilliant idea to go over there and get those airplanes off the ice. Brand new World War II airplanes sitting there on the ice. He said, hey, let's brush off the snow, gas them up, and fly them home. Well, it wasn't quite that easy. They had to find them using ground-penetrating radar because the airplanes were under 263 feet of ice in 48 years. They melted a hole down to get to one of them, a P-38, and took it apart and brought all the pieces up through the hole. They call it cold mining with a hot tube they ran water through called the gopher. They melted a hole down there, took the airplane apart, brought the pieces up through the hole, and put it back together in Middleborough, Kentucky. It flew a couple years ago for the first time in nearly 50 years. Now, when they melted down to get to the airplane, they went through ice rings. Interesting. Airplanes are in the ground for 48 years. They were 263 feet down. Those are historical scientific facts, okay? That's five and a half feet a year worth of ice accumulating on top of those planes. You had 10,000 feet as the deepest hole they ever drilled. You divide that by five and a half and you get 1,800 years, not 135,000. Now, deeper layers get squished, I understand. The pressure changes it to fern, F-I-R-N. I understand that. I taught her science for years. So really, 4,400 is no problem. 4,400 years is no problem to account for all the ice at the North and South Pole. Well, I went up and visited the airport where they're putting this thing together. I got to talk to the guy who helped dig it out. His name is Bob Cardin. There's his picture and his phone number right there. Call him if you don't believe me. I said, Bob, when you melted down to get to that airplane, did you go through ice rings? He said, oh, yes, many hundreds of them. I said, how could there be hundreds of annual rings in 48 years? Shouldn't there be like maybe, you know, 48? <laughs> he said, annual rings? <laughs> he said, those aren't annual rings. He said, that doesn't represent summer, winter, summer, winter. It represents warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. You can get five of those in one week around here, can't you? Yeah. But here's a Scientific American article where the guy is still calling them annual layers. Now, folks, either he's confused or he's, he's, he's under-informed of the topic or he's deliberately lying. He may just be ignorant, okay? I hope that's the case because ignorance can be fixed. Stupid is forever, but <laughs> ignorance can be fixed, all right? That's the difference, by the way. The guy that works with the Eskimos sent me this postcard and said, Brother Hovind, uh, I work with the Eskimos in Alaska. He said they've got over 40 words for snow up here, different types of snow. He said, I got 18 there are 15 layers of snow on my car in eight hours. Not 15 inches, 15 layers of snow. Those layers are not different ages, not a year apart. Same thing with the textbook when they tell the kids about the Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic. How many have ever heard of the geologic column before? We cover much more on that on video four. The geologic column is a joke. It doesn't exist any place on planet Earth except in the textbooks. Get our video number four for more on that. Those layers are not different ages. All over the world, petrified trees have been found standing up, connecting these layers. Now, they're telling us these layers are different ages, and yet we've got petrified trees connecting them. I'm sorry, you're mistaken. The layers are not different ages. They all formed in one flood. And it doesn't take long for things to petrify. They can, things can petrify quickly. Here's a piece of petrified firewood. I've got a petrified pickle in my museum in Pensacola. The lid to the jar rusted off and the pickle turned to stone inside the jar. We got the jar and the pickle. Come on up and see it. One kid sent me a bag of petrified acorns with a little note. He said, Brother Hovind, I put these acorns in the water to hope they would sprout and I forgot about them. Ten years old, you know. <laughs> Next spring, my mom found the bucket on the back porch and said, son, get rid of these acorns. He said, in less than a year, they turned to stone. I've got them in the museum. Stop and see our dinosaur adventure land in Pensacola, Florida. Here's a petrified fish giving birth. It doesn't take millions of years to give birth, praise God, okay? <laughs> There's a petrified cowboy boot with the cowboy's legs still in it. It's on the table now. There's an article about it. It's called The Limestone Cowboy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, we cover more on that on videotape number six about petrification. Uh, the Mississippi River is depositing sediments at the rate of 80,000 tons every hour. 80,000 tons of mud comes down the Mississippi and dumps off in New Orleans. That delta is growing larger and larger and larger. There's no question there's a lot of mud coming down that river. They call it the muddy Mississippi. And there's no question the delta is growing. 
But it's interesting, after studying the delta carefully, they've drilled holes all over that thing looking for oil under it, you know. The estimate, current estimate is that the delta has about 30,000 years worth of mud out there. Okay, well then I have a question. If the earth is millions of years old, why isn't the whole Gulf of Mexico full of mud by now? Mm -hmm. They're going to say, hey, Hoven is 30,000 years, that proves your Bible's wrong, your Bible says 6,000. Well, no, I, I got a theory about that delta. Now here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. And as the flood water was running off, <clears throat> about half of that mud went out there in 20 minutes. So it looks like it took 30,000 years. They forgot the flood. That'll mess them up every time. A friend of mine from Louisiana is a, his pastor of a church now, but he said, Brother Hovind, I used to drill for oil in the Gulf of Mexico. He said, we drilled through 14,000 feet of mud and hit trees 60 feet tall, under 14,000 feet of mud. Folks, most of that mud was washed out in a big catastrophe called the flood. Here's a picture of the oldest tree in the world. The oldest living tree is a bristlecone pine in Southern California. Estimates of the age of the tree vary from 4,300 to 4,700. This textbook says 4,300 years old is the oldest organism. Now, the fact is, trees don't always produce one ring a year. They can produce two rings a year. Okay? One guy said in a seminar, I had a Q&A session, he said, Mr. Oven, you're exactly right. He said, I'm a professional wood carver. I've done it for 40 years. He said, I plant my own trees and carve and make walking sticks for people, expensive walking sticks, you know, for rich people who can pay a thousand bucks for one or whatever. He said, we grow our trees for seven years, cut them down. They always have at least 11 rings in seven years. That's what he told me. He said, I've been doing it for 40 years. Anyway, this textbook says the oldest tree is 4,300 years old. Now, that's interesting. I have a question. If the earth is billions of years old, uh, why don't we have an older tree someplace? Why would the oldest tree on earth be 4,300 years old? Well, I have a theory about that. Here's my theory. I believe 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. Wrecked everything. So the oldest tree ought to be less than uh, 4,400 years old. Amen. It is. Here's a picture of a coral reef. You know, the largest reef in the world is off the coast of Australia. It's called the Great Barrier Reef. I had a call from a church in Brisbane. They said, do you want to come preach over here? I said, I need to pray about this. He said, yes. <laughs> I took my whole family to Australia. My daughter and I got to go scuba diving at the Great Barrier Reef. It was incredible. During World War II, some of the reef was destroyed by ships and anchors and bombs and stuff like that. So the environmentalist wackos went out there to see how fast it grows back. They watched the reef grow for 20 years. It was a government project. Based on a 20-year study, they said the reef is less than 4,200 years old. Oh, okay. Well, then I have a question. If the earth is millions of years old, why don't we have a bigger reef someplace? Why would the biggest reef on earth be less than 4,200 years old? I have a theory about that. <laughs> I, I bet you know what it is, don't you? You can figure it out. Okay. Here's a picture of Niagara Falls. The textbook says, boys and girls, the rocky ledge above Niagara Falls has been eroding for 9,900 years. Now, how do they know that? Well, it's pretty interesting. The rocks are breaking off the edge. All waterfalls do that, you know. The water rocks break off the edge, and the waterfall eats its way backwards. The water flows one way, the waterfall moves the other way in response to the erosion. They've studied Niagara Falls pretty carefully for the last 200 years. They say it's moving back 4.7 feet a year. Interesting. Well, when Charlie Lyle went there in 1840, he said Niagara Falls is obviously back here, and it quite obviously started up here by Lewiston, New York. It's moving back down the gully. Charlie Lyle said, I think it took 10,000 years to go that far. Now, he said that purposely to try to discredit the Bible. Charlie Lyle hated the Bible. And that's the book that destroyed the faith of Charles Darwin. We get into more of that on videotape number four. But Lyle, the people, he said it took 10,000 years. The people that lived there said, hey, it erodes much faster than that. But he didn't listen to them. He had his theory. He had his agenda to push, okay? He wanted to discredit the scriptures. Now, the fact is, the water goes over the falls into a gorge called the Niagara Gorge. I was just there a couple of weeks ago. That gorge is seven and a half miles long. All right, this textbook says a simple calculation shows it's been 9,900 years worth of erosion. Well, it's not quite that simple, okay? You see, Niagara Falls is right here. It used to be further north by Lewiston. It's moving south, quite obviously. 
because the water flows north. I got a question now. If the Earth is millions of years old, why hasn't it eroded all the way back to Lake Erie? Why is Niagara Falls right there? Well, I have a theory about that. Here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. As the flood water was running off, whoosh, about half of that gully washed out in 20 minutes. So it looks like it took 9,900 years by the textbook. No, they forgot the flood. They also forgot to get the right numbers, okay? So if it had divided right, it would have been 8,400 using the 4.7. But, you know, public school textbook, what do you expect? Okay. Um, when it rains, 30% of the water runs into the ocean. The rest evaporates or soaks into the ground. Well, as it runs into the ocean, it brings with it mineral salts off the ground. It washes salts off the ground called mineral salts. The oceans are getting saltier every day because of the distillation process of sunlight evaporating water out and, you know, minerals washing in and water coming out. The minerals don't come out, just the water. Today, the oceans are 3.6% salt. They could have done that in less than 5,000 years. I was in a debate one time and this atheist said, Hovind, would you please tell me how the freshwater fish survived Noah's flood? I said, well, sir, aren't you assuming the flood was salt water? He said, the ocean is salt water. I said, well, yeah, it is today. <laughs> I think during the flood, it's probably mostly fresh water. He said, well, how did the saltwater fish survive? I said, well, there probably weren't any. He said, the ocean is full of saltwater creatures. I said, well, yeah, it is today. I said, I think what happened over the last 40, 400 years, some animals have gradually become adapted to salt water. And today we have freshwater alligators and freshwater crocodiles and saltwater crocodiles. And they probably had a common ancestor, a crocodile. <laughs> he said, that's evolution. I said, oh, it is not. Going from a freshwater croc to a saltwater croc is a minor change compared to what you believe. So you believe they changed from a rock to a croc. <laughs> Now, there's a major change for you folks. Yes, sir. How many of you have ever gone into a cave and the guide said, don't touch the formations. They take millions of years to form. They all have the same story, right? You go to Carlsbad, they'll say, yep, it took 250 million years to make these formations in here. They say tiny drops of water slowly build these formations. One guy said it takes a thousand years to grow from one-tenth of a centimeter to ten centimeters, up to two and a half inches. Maximum be two and a half inches per thousand years. Well, I don't think so. Here are some 50 inch long stalactites growing under the Lincoln Memorial, built 1922. Here's a bat covered up with flowstone before it could rot. It doesn't take millions of years for that stuff to form. Here's two inch stalactites growing off a refrigeration shed in Pensacola, Florida. There's a building in Indiana, it's only 40 years old. The basement is full of huge flowstone formations in 40 years from water dripping through the limestone. There's a mine in Australia that was closed down for 55 years. When they opened it up to just check to see how it's doing, there were huge cave formations that formed in 55 years. There are two people inside that circle to give you an idea how big this is. There's a pipe that was dripping water up at Herbert Field near Pensacola at Eglin Air Force Base. It made a 13-inch stalactite in seven years. Underneath on the ground was a stalagmite. Everybody kept tripping on it, and so they broke it off and gave it to me. It's in my museum. Stalagmite formed in seven years. Here's a parking garage in Texas. Brand new parking garage built in 1997. It was making stalagmites on students' cars parking under it, so they put up a drip pan to catch the water. <coughs> a guy in Wyoming had a hot mineral spring on his property in Thermopolis, Wyoming, and so he stuck a pipe in the ground back in 1903. The water came out the top of the pipe, ran down the sides. They called it the teepee fountain, kind of a natural fountain. Everybody thought, wow, that's cute. He's got a fountain in his yard. Well, slowly over the years, the water, as it ran down the side of the pipe, evaporated, some of it, leaving behind mineral deposits. How many have seen those mineral deposits in your sink, okay? Well, the guy died, and they left the pipe sticking in the yard. It's now been there for 100 years. Here it is, about six years ago. That would take some lime away to scrub that clean, don't you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure would. It does not take millions of years to form those things. That's 100 years worth. The guy down the street started one later. It's not quite as big. But folks, it doesn't take a long time. Did you know at the current rate of erosion, the continents are going to erode flat in 14 million years? We have mudslides, landslides, of course, erosion, abrasion, exfoliation. Does the ground ever fall up? 
It's always down, isn't it? Sedimentary rock's always on its way down anyway. You might get igneous rock coming up, volcanoes. Did you know, they're telling us we got fossils in sedimentary rock that are 300 times older than the current erosion rate would allow for. Hmm. All you got to do is fly out west. Two days ago, I flew back from Grand Canyon, flew out west. You just look out the window of the plane, folks. It looks like there's erosion marks every place down there in places that hardly ever rain. We cover Grand Canyon in video four also. If you think that river made that canyon, you need to watch video number four. Um, erosion marks all over this world are evidence of massive flooding on this planet. And we could spend all day on that. We cover more in video six. A couple more things and we'll quit. The oldest writings in the world are about 5,000 years old. Well, that's interesting. Why would the oldest writings be 5,000 years old? Why does the Chinese calendar say this is the year 4704 right now? They think they started with Noah. The Chinese calendar, or the Hebrew calendar, said this is the year 5764. They think they started with Adam with their calendar. Don't trust the Egyptian calendar, by the way. That one's greatly exaggerated. Get the book Evolution Cruncher, a 900 page book for five bucks. Go to our website, it's a great book with lots of good stuff on evolution. Why would the oldest reliable historical records be less than 6,000 years old? I have a theory about that. <laughs> I think the Bible is absolutely correct. I think the evidence for a young earth is overwhelming. The evidence for an old earth is minimal. And like the coins in the box, you have to go by the limiting factors. Each one of the evidences for a young earth would have to be overcome. Each single one would stand independently. Students are never shown the idea, though, that the earth might be young. I think I know why. This isn't really a science book anymore. It's a book about evolution. Somebody wants to make sure your kids believe that theory because it's part of a much bigger long-range plan toward a new world order. There's a reason for this. The founding fathers who started this country said, We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain rights. Where do rights come from? Well, they come from the Creator. And if you get a bunch of people together who believe they have rights that come from the Creator, those people do not make good slaves. They will actually throw the tea in the harbor and start a big war. <laughs> they will. Now, if you want to have a one-world government, a new world order like some of these lunatics would like to have, and like is prophesied in the Bible, they're going to get it. You can't have people believing in creation. So they've been working really hard for the last hundred years to take over the school system where they only teach this evolution theory which says rights come from government. Rights don't come from the Creator because there is no Creator. It ties into many things. We cover more on that on video five. For example, do you have the right to have a church? The government says in the Internal Revenue Code 501c3 that you, you can ask to be a, an exemption to the tax laws if you'd like. And most churches do that. They file papers to become a corporation, which is a creature of the state, and then they become 501c3 exempt. But they admitted a couple pages later in Internal Revenue Code 508 that churches are an exception. Why would you give up an exception status to become an exemption? <laughs> Think about it. There's more on that on the website hushmoney.org. Same thing with marriage. Why do you ask the state for permission to get marriage? Who gives the right to get married? Uh, that's another long story. We cover that in our college class. But, but you know, 75% of the kids that go to public schools are going to lose their faith after one year of college. 75%. That's what happened to Crawford Toy. Most of you have probably never heard of Crawford Toy. Crawford Toy was a brilliant Bible scholar. He worked with the Southern Baptist Convention in the eight, late 1800s. He loved the Lord and loved the Bible. He was a professor at the, at the Southern Baptist Seminary. You might know about the girl he almost married. He just about married a girl named Lottie Moon. How many have ever heard of Lottie Moon before? Every year the Southern Baptists have the Lottie Moon offering. Well, Crawford went to Europe and studied evolution after the Civil War. He came back convinced the theory was true. He told his class, he said, the Bible intends to teach a plain six-day creation. The Bible is simply in error at that point. Uh, the Bible's in error? Crawford, maybe your theory's in error. Maybe you have been brainwashed. Uh, folks, it is very easy to get brainwashed. I'm going to try to brainwash the entire crowd here tonight, and then we're going to quit, take some break, and have some question and answer time. I'm going to tell you a little story. 
As I tell the story, I will brainwash you. Maybe you've never been brainwashed before. It's okay, it's a harmless procedure, right? When I'm done brainwashing you, I will ask you two questions about the story. If you know the answer, it's probably because you saw my video before. <laughs> if you don't know the answer, it's because you were successfully brainwashed. Now, pay attention, watch carefully, here goes the story. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left and jogged back home. As he was jogging home, he noticed two masked men waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men and why did he leave home jogging? If you know for sure, don't say it out loud, just raise your hand. Six, seven, eight, about twelve, okay? The rest of you, pay attention, let's try it again. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. I'll give you a hint, that's important. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways, turned left, and jogged back home. As he was jogging home, he noticed two masked men waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men, and why did he leave home jogging? Anybody new figured out? Four more. Okay, the rest of you? Pay attention. We're going to try it again. Now I'm going to unbrainwash you. Now watch carefully. I'll tell the same story and you'll feel yourself get unbrainwashed in a few seconds. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways, turned left, and jogged back home. As he was jogging home, he noticed two masked men were waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men and why did he leave home jogging? Uh, the catcher in the umpire, and he hit a home run. <laughs> you say, Brother Hovind, is it that easy to get brainwashed? Yep. You see, as soon as I said a man left home, you started thinking about a house, right? And for the rest of the story, you could not figure out who those two masked men were. If you get somebody off track in the first few seconds, it's real tough to get back on track. Would you like to see how thousands of kids get brainwashed in Duval County? every year, thousands of them, right here in the middle of the Bible Belt. The kid goes to kindergarten, maybe some kid out of your house, maybe one of your children goes to kindergarten, and he gets a book like this, I Can Read About Dinosaurs. Would anybody like to just take a wild guess at what the first sentence in the book says? <laughs> Millions of years ago. Do you think there's any books like this in your school system? You think there's any books like this in your public library? You think the kids are going to hear this stuff on Nature Channel, Steve Irwin, Crocodile Hunter, Discovery Channel, National Geographic? Of course they are. Dr. Seuss, millions of years before you were born. It's everywhere, folks. I go to museums all the time. I am sick and tired of all the museums teaching evolution. So we started our own, a creation museum. Come visit Pensacola, Florida. When they say the earth is millions of years old, that's calling Jesus a liar. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Do you realize we got Christians that teach their kids, we have death in the world because of man's sin. And then they read them a story about dinosaurs dying before man got here. <coughs> Hello? Have you thought about the inconsistency in your logic? Well, we cover more on that in other series, seminar series, but the Bible says they lived to be 900 years old before the flood. How's that possible? Well, we cover that on video number two. How on earth did they live to be 900? What was that Garden of Eden like? What was it like before the flood? We cover that on seminar part two. And you can watch our seminars right online. And what about dinosaurs? Didn't dinosaurs live millions of years ago? Uh, no. Dinosaurs lived with Adam and Eve. We cover that on video number three, all about dinosaurs. But listen, somebody's going to teach your kids. You started like a slime and you slowly evolved to a human. That teaching is going to destroy their whole philosophy of life. The Bible says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. If a kid goes 12 to 16 years to school in your school system, how is he going to view the world? Now look, I'm not against schools. I'm not against teachers. My brother led me to the Lord. He's been a public school teacher for 34 years. My mom was a public school teacher and retired years ago. She's been in heaven for 10 years now. I'm not against the schools, I'm not against the teachers, but folks, the books teach something that's going to destroy your kid's philosophy. 
The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He says he did it in six days. You know, if the Bible's right about the beginning, uh, maybe it's...